church. Good morning. Man, it's so awesome to see you this morning. I uh, want to welcome Hayward to so glad that you are joining us. Now, we are back in our series uh, called uh, The Gospel According to Moses, and we're going to continue to see uh, the gospel in this beautiful book, um, the second book of the entire Bible. And what you'll see is this perpetual theme, and the theme surfaces to the top just like a carpet stain, constantly coming up. And the theme is this, God is a saving God. Amen? amen. Say amen. amen. Yeah, God is a saving God. He saves us. He's constantly saving us when we don't think that he's saving us. And today we are uh, looking at a very famous and yet somewhat curious event in history, which is the 10 plagues of Egypt. Now, this spans all the way from uh, Exodus 5 all the way through 10, and we're going to survey that, and we're going to try to learn how God is saving us uh, through this judgment. And it all starts in chapter 5, when God sent Moses to Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go that they might worship me. Then in verse 2 in chapter 5, Pharaoh says, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Now listen, them are fighting words, right? Them are fighting words, right? This is like the daddy standoff, right? You realize he says, why should I listen to God? What is he going to do? I'm Pharaoh, the greatest leader of all of Egypt. I mean, we have our God, you have yours. Why is your daddy greater than mine? It's a daddy standoff, right? Remember in the playgrounds, we used to have the daddy standoffs? Remember, instead of fighting because we couldn't fight and because we really couldn't fight, we just, you know, talked a lot. And we used to say, my daddy could beat your daddy up. And the other guy's like, no, my daddy could beat your daddy up. And you're like, my daddy has a membership at 24-hour fitness. And he's like, oh, my daddy goes to 24-hour fitness and says that your daddy never shows up, right? <laughs> Like, you're like, my daddy knows karate. And I used to always say, my daddy's Bruce Lee. <laughs> right? I used to always would like, oh, man. You know? <laughs> right? I mean, we used to have this daddy standoff, and now Pharaoh's doing the same thing. And Pharaoh's like, who is your God? Who is your God that I should obey him? Oh, and Pharaoh had a bad day because, you know, he's picking about, he's talking about the God, right? Right? He's talking about the one and only God. He picked on the wrong daddy. And when he says, I should obey, who should I, who is he that I should obey God? That's when the 10 plays gets initiated. That's how it starts. Now, most people think that the lesson of the 10 plague is reduced to, listen, don't mess with God or he's going to judge you or throw down on you. Okay, and let me just clarify right now that that is a very superficial view. Oh, that if you offend God, that he's going to do something. He's going to cause a car accident in your life or give you a virus or a cold or some cancer to teach you a lesson. This is what we believe. And so because these are the things that we believe, we have two superficial responses to judgment of God. We say first, on, on one camp we say, yeah, God, get him. Man, he just cut me off. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah, he's getting pulled over. Yes, thank you, Lord. That's what we say. Right? On the other end, we say something like, you know what? I would never worship a God who's, uh, who's, who's so wrathful in judgment. I wouldn't worship a God like that. I worship a God who is all loving. And both of these things are very superficial views. And what I want to do today is to teach you the real significance of the 10 plagues because there's a deeper message there, far more deeper than these two superficial views. The plagues come to answer one question, that is, why should you obey God? Why should you obey God? And this is a very significant question, and I'm going to spend the entire time trying to answer that question, why you should obey God. And in fact, today, if you particularly sin with a particular sin, um, I pray that God would speak to you sweetly and that he would convince you that he will long and pull you towards his, his obedience. If you're not a believer here today, I pray that you would leave with a different perspective of God. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Exodus chapter 7. We're going to start from verse 14. Exodus chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 14. 
and we have some ushers. They're going to come down with the Bibles. If you, don't hold a, if you don't have a Bible in your hand right now, I'll go ahead and grab one of these so that they could uh, hand it to you. If you don't own a Bible, feel free to take it in both campuses here and in Hayward. Um, for the remainder of you, would you stand from your seats for the reading of God's Word? Exodus 7, chapter, uh, chapter, uh, verse 14 through 18. This is the word of the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. As he is going out to the water, stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand a staff that turned into a serpent. And when you shall, I mean, you shall say to him, the Lord the God of the Hebrews sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed, thus says the Lord. By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile shall stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. That is the word of the Lord for this morning, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. <clears throat> we just read first of the ten plagues. The very first is the contamination of the Nile. The very last is the killing of the firstborn of all the Egyptian families. Now, there are 10 plagues, and there are five chapters, six chapters, and we're going to do a survey of the entire section of this scripture. And now these 10 plagues show us three reasons as to why we should obey God. And if you're taking notes, here's the first. He is the God above all gods, and this is why we should obey him, because he's the God above all gods. When Pharaoh says here, who is the Lord that I should obey him? He's not speaking as a religious atheist, but did you know that he's speaking as a religious pluralist? You see, because back then there were hardly any religious atheists in those days um, because just about everybody was a religious pluralist, and they, meaning that they believed in many gods. So when he says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? He's not saying like an atheist would and say, I don't believe that God exists. That's not what he's saying. Instead, what Pharaoh is saying is, who is this God? that I should listen to above my God or the many gods here in the land of Egypt. Why is your God better than my God? Why is your God more supreme than my God? Why should I convert to your God when I have many awesome gods myself? You see, this was a total daddy standoff. My God is better than yours, right? It was a daddy standoff. And what's interesting is that Pharaoh's view many thousands of years ago is the current view of the Bay Area. Because you realize if you are talking to any non-believers, you rarely run into atheists, but you run into a lot of pluralists, which means that there are people who basically say, yeah, all gods are the same gods. All gods lead to the same God. Everybody is good, but there's one thing that you cannot do in our culture. You know what that is? You can't say your God is the only God. Or you can't say your God is above all the other God. Because if you do that, then our culture will balk at you and say, listen, you are the most arrogant, nasty, evil person to say that. So you could work at Facebook or Google or Apple and believe in your little Christian God, but don't believe that Christians are the only God. You know, that they only have, that they worship their only God. Don't say that. Don't be exclusive or else... You have no right to do that. Nobody can be sure the view of spirituality is right. You're right? That's what they would say. They would say, how could you be sure? Nobody can be sure that your God is the only God. That every God is the same. Every God is good. And my answer to that always is, you know, if you say nobody can be sure, how could you be so sure that I'm wrong? Right? When you believe in a pluralistic position of a spiritual reality, why would you say then mine is wrong? If you say nobody could be sure, because by stating that I'm wrong, it's saying that you are somehow right when you say nobody is right. Do you see how that works? You see? So 
When somebody says, man, it's arrogant to think that your take on spiritual reality is right and other people are wrong, then it is no less arrogant to say that your view of spiritual reality is right because it just seems more tolerant. All to say that the average Bay Area person or native thinks exactly what Pharaoh thought. But the first thing that we learn in this text about the plagues is that Pharaoh was wrong, that there is a God above all gods. Now, notice this, that all the plagues that were cast down, they were hand-chosen. They were quite filled with design, chosen by God. Do you know that the Nile River was God? Do you know that the first, contamin the first uh, plague was the contamination of the Nile River Bank, right? Do you know that the Nile River was God? People used to worship the, uh, the God of the Nile. Now, God strikes, down and strikes that Nile River to say that I'm a God above all gods. Remember the ninth plague? What, what it was was there was total darkness in the land during daytime. What, what God struck was the sun and the moon. It was gone, right? Do you know the sun and the moon were gods that the Egyptians would worship in the pantheon? Right, they would worship it. That's to say that God is saying, I am above all all gods. In fact, the, the verse that we read in verse 17 here says this, by this you shall know that I am the Lord, says God. In fact, Exodus 9, 13 says, let my people go, for this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself, listen, so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth, that you shall know. I'm going to give you the plague so that you shall know that there's none like me in all the earth. I am the God above all gods. There's none like me. And this is the reason why we should obey. Remember when we used to say to people, I'm not listening to you. You're not my daddy. Well, newsflash comes to find out that he is your daddy. <laughs> and you better listen to him because he is the God above all gods. Amen? Now listen, Christians, with that said, we have to be incredibly humble about this. Why? Because you know that salvation is not gained through your merit, but it was given to you. So if it is given to you by Jesus' merit and not your merit, then we approach this not so proudly to say, our God is the only God and your God is a no-go God. No, we don't say that. We believe that absolutely with great conviction we could uh, continue to converse and have those conversations with the world, but we do it with utter humility because there's nothing that you brought to the table that made you more likable to be saved than them. Amen? And so we come as incredibly humble people. And we address, you know what's so fascinating? I have a lot of conversations with non-Christians. And they like almost get tripped up when I just approach it very humbly. They're like, oh, I didn't expect kindness. Right? This is what they say. Christians are to be kind. Christians are to be humble. Because that's what the gospel does. It humbles us. Amen? All right, here's the second thing. He is, we should obey him because he is the God who designed our hearts who designed our hearts. Now, this is so fascinating that when the scholars study the plagues, one thing that they've noticed is how natural all the plagues are, meaning how non-miraculous uh, they are. For example, the first plague was the Nile being contaminated and basically made it undrinkable. So what it did was it screwed up the ecosystem of the Nile. The ecosystem was completely destroyed. Now, notice... All the rest of the plagues, okay, are subsequent to uh, the very first plague, which is the contamination of that ecosystem. Namely, what's the second plague? All the frogs leave the Nile, right? Why? Because the first plague was the contamination. So the frogs say, I'm out of here. So they leave the marshes and billions, billions of frogs everywhere going into the homes, going into the ovens, going into the bedrooms, dying, dead, stinking carcasses everywhere, right? Because why? Because the first, uh, first uh, plague, which was the contamination of the Nile, and because these stinky carcasses are everywhere, what comes next? Gnats. That's the third, right? Gnats come everywhere. It says that they were as numerous as dust, if you could imagine. And then what comes there? Some bigger gnats called the flies. Fly infestation everywhere, right? Because uh, gnats came, but because the frogs died, because the Nile was contaminated. Do you see? 
Do you see how natural this is? In fact, I was doing some research this week, and I found secular scientists, non-believing scientists, making rational arguments for the 10 plagues to say, yeah, that makes sense. This is a natural phenomenon. And they are arguing how this could actually happen in history. Why? Because it was so unmiraculous. It was so natural. So after the gnats come, the epidemics hit with all these flies, and then it goes to the livestock. Fifth curse, fifth plague was all the cows and livestock dies, right? And when the f- livestock dies, what happens? Sixth is human beings, epidemic towards humans. They, they get boils in their face and all of their body, and people are dying. See how natural this is? This is so natural. This is the reason why Pharaoh didn't obey the first six, seven, eight, and nine, because it just seems so natural. They're like, yeah, your God didn't do this. This is just luck. This is natural. This is amazing. You see, this is God's great design for your life. Now, I want, I want, you, to, I want you to consider this. I want you to just simply pause here and consider. If you were God... And you wanted to convince Pharaoh uh, that you are the authoritative God, you're the only God, you're the God above all gods, and you wanted them to release your people. I mean, would you have chosen to contaminate the Nile? I mean, you could do all things. Why would you do that when you have all power in your hands? Why pick something so natural, right? Why? You see, for me, if I was God, I would, from the very get-go, do something phenomenal. Instead of contaminating the Nile, you know what I would do? I would get that mountain and flip it upside down. I'm like, ooh, what's up? See, he's the real God. Or I would give power to Moses to turn anything into, any human being into animals, right? And Moses would go into the family, let my people go. Watch this, y'all. And like point at one of his guards and say, boom, he turned into an ass. Okay. I mean, a donkey, not a jerk. Okay, donkey. Boom, turns into a donkey, right? Turns into an ass. And he turns to Pharaoh and says, you're next. What do you think the Pharaoh would, what do you think Pharaoh would have done? Right? He would have knelt, submitted on the ground, right? He doesn't want to be an ass. Donkey, not jerk, right? I mean, he, Right? Why didn't God do that? Why did, why did God choose something so natural, something so biological, right? Surely, God could have done it differently so his power was absolutely unmistaken. Why are the plagues so natural? Why does it do it this way? Well, listen, the plagues, if you haven't noticed, they have a message. And scholars have noted for decades that Exodus 5 through 10, which lays out the 10 plagues, is an undoing, unraveling of what happened in Genesis 1 and 2. What we see in Exodus 5 through 10, nature is falling apart. Nature, entropy, nature uh, going out of control, breaking down, reverting back to pre-creation chaos. Remember pre-creation in Genesis 1, before anything happened, before the earth was formed, there was utter chaos, utter darkness, right? You see, but yet uh, what we see here uh, in after that void and darkness and chaos, we see in Genesis 1, God and the presence of God comes and he starts forming things, he starts knitting things, he starts developing things, and there's harmony, there's beauty, There's peace. There's love. These things come out. So what happens when you deconstruct something like that? Then chaos and darkness and pain. And this is why we see here in this account every day creation literally is being undone. As the water is destroyed, as it affects the critters, as the critters affect the insects, as the insects grow and affect the livestock, and the livestock affects human beings, until we are literally back in Genesis 1, verse 2, where it says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. This was before creation. The earth was completely chaotic, dark, and without the Spirit, but when the Spirit of God comes, so interesting, light, beauty, order, And what God is telling us through the plagues is this. 
I've knitted you together in a way when my presence is over you, you have radical integration and harmony. But when you disobey and when my presence is not with you, there's radical disintegration and chaos in your life. Simply put, God has knitted together, us together, that when we obey God, there's natural flourishing. But when we disobey God, then there's also natural disintegration, right? We not only violate God when we disobey Him, but we violate ourselves. That's how it works. Disintegration that seems so natural. I'll give you an example. Say you're a middle-aged man. Say you're about 55 years old and you go to the doctor to get a checkup and your doctor is astonished because your blood pressure level is sky high. He says, listen, you have to do something immediately. You need to start exercising and you need to eliminate all salt and sodium from your diet. Now you could do a couple things. First you can say, just like Pharaoh did, who is this doctor that I should obey him? You can say that. Man, doctor, I'm not going to listen to you. Man, I'm going to tonight eat Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and for good measure, I'm going to get some nachos. I'm going to eat that, and for dessert, I'm going to have some Cheetos on top of that. Okay, you could say that, or you could say, man, I better listen to the doctor because if I don't, then, you know, my blood pressure will lead to the thinning of my blood vessels. And when my th blood vessels thin, then there could be all problems and clogging and puncturing. And, and, and that might lead to strokes and that might lead to a heart attack. That might lead to my ninth plague, which is like darkness of me getting unconscious. And lastly, eventually the tenth plague, which is death. It might lead to that, Right? After all, listen, so as to, as to violate the doctor's directives is to violate me, right? To not listen to the doctor is to violate not only the doctor, but me. After all, the doctor is not telling you all these things to limit you, but to flourish you so that you could honor the fabric of your design. So if you violate the doctor's directives, at the same time, you are violating um, yourself. And so it is with God, except times a million. Why? Because the doctor has studied your physical fabric, but God created it. And secondly, God doesn't just know about your physical fabric, but he knows your emotional, your psychological, your sociological, and your spiritual fabric. So when God gives you a directive to follow, a commandment to follow, he's not just giving, you, giving it to you to say, you better obey just so that you know that I'm the God above all gods. He's not just saying that. He's not wielding his authority and power just so that he could be recognized and glorified. No, he's doing that for your flourishing, right? Because he's your maker. And you've been wonderfully made to obey God, to flourish. And to obey God is to flourish in our lives because we are living in our design. Otherwise, we experience emotional, social, and spiritual integration. This is all very natural. Well, let me give you examples of how this works. Take the very first commandment that God says. He says, you shall not have any other gods before me. As to say that there's nothing that should be in our lives more important than God. He says, God says, I must be your first and only. But let's say that you put your career, or you started your own organization, you started your own company, you're really into it, you're embedded, you're, you're actually spending like 14 hours a day slaving over it, and that becomes your identity. Or let's say you, uh, you make your children your identity. You're a mom and you worship your children. You know, you take your kids to all the sporting events and you do not uh, honor uh, just keeping your Sabbath holy, whatever it is. You just don't, you're always worshiping your children that's all you're doing. Well, I, you know, here's what God doesn't do, okay? If, if, if you are putting your career above God, he doesn't say, huh, let me see, I'll, I'll give that dude a, a broken leg, right? He doesn't do that. Or he says, you know, to that mama that is going to that soccer game instead of church, I'm going to give her a little fender bender to teach her a lesson. God doesn't do that to contrary beliefs. Well, he can do that. But what's natural in our sin is 
far deeper than that, which is when we sin, when we don't obey God, then there's natural disintegration of our lives. So say you put your career uh, more important than God. You'll soon experience marital disintegration, family disintegration. There's going to be dysfunction in communication in your family. Your children will say, Daddy, where are you? You're never with us and for us. You miss my dance recital again. You never show up to anything that I do. You're always about your work, and your home will not be at peace. So say something happens to your job then. You get fired, you get let go, then there's also emotional disintegration that leads to anxieties and worries which will affect your physical disintegration. You see, you are reverting to chaos. That's what happens. Or say you put your children more important than God, and they become your primary identity and serve as your functional savior. Not Jesus, but they become who, uh, who gives you all your values and all your joy, right? What if they get really sick? What if they get really hurt? What if they move out and make terrible life decisions? Then what? Then you'll try to trust God, but I'll tell you, you won't be able to. It'll be very hard because for years, you put your ch trust in children, not God. What makes you think you could kind of turn on your furnace like that just in an instant? In the same vein, say you're not tithing. Say you're not trusting God with all of your resources. You don't see that all the things that you have is from God. All good, perfect gifts are from him. And God says, I'll be your provider, but give me your first fruit so that you could continue to learn that I am your provider and that you could rest and give me your first, right? But you don't trust God. You trust money. You trust your savviness. You trust your bank account. Then and when, when tragedy comes, you'll want to turn to God to trust him through your suffering. You'll desperately need him, but you won't be able to. You know why? Because all along, you did not deposit trust with God. By the time that you want to actually withdraw from that trust, that bank account will be empty. You won't have anything. How do you build up that trust account? You trust with little things every single day. That when big things happen, you're like, of course, I've lived a life of trust, and God has been faithful all throughout my entire life. And that's when you see Christians who've been trusting God with all of their lives. When turmoil and tragedy hits, they're not shaken. And the kind of Christians that buckle on their knees and just can't get up out of bed and, you know, are, are just super worried and filled with anxiety are, are Christians who have not banked trust with God. And you see, this is the kind of in, uh, disintegration that we experience. So what God teaches us through the plague is that, yes, there can be times when he allows great tragedies in our lives to grab our attention. Uh, we see some examples of that in the Bible, but most of the time, primarily, when we disobey, we are the ones who are unleashing the chaos of creation and order. And deconstruction happens very naturally in our lives. That's how he made us. So what God is saying in the plague is, listen, to be in my presence is to be fully alive. To move away from my presence and from my will is to destroy yourself and to unleash forces and chaos and disintegration in your life. That's why you should obey. That's the second reason why we should obey, because he designed you. And he designed you to obey so that you could flourish. But that's not all, because if I left you there, you would obey only out of fear. You would only obey so that you wouldn't get whammied, you know? You would only obey so that you wouldn't be punished by God. But punishment never works. Obedience out of fear never works. The Bible says that, that it is his kindness, it is uh, that his, his grace, his mercy that leads us to repentance, not our fear of him. See, what we need is his love. We need his grace. We need his mercy. So here's the third thing. We obey God because he's the God who saves us graciously. He saves us. Now what's so fascinating as you read about the 10 plagues is that you can't get, you can't help but to get a sense that God is holding back judgment constantly. He seems like he's always pulling punches, you know? Like pulling back punches. He's not fully giving it to them. For example, in chapter 9, right before the hail comes to destroy all things, right? 
This is what he says. He says, listen to the Egyptians. He says, I'm about to send hail. What you need to do is get all your cattle underneath the roof. He says, and get all the people who are actually serving and helping the cattle to live. Okay, get all the farmhands in out of the field. Get them out or they're going to be hurt. Now, that's curious to me, right? Because if you're throwing down judgment to make a point, isn't the point of judgment to see people suffer? I mean, shouldn't God throw down hail during the day when all the people are out and about? That's what we'll teach them. But instead, what we see here in Exodus 9 is like, God's like, I'm going to bring this. Now get under. <laughs> Why is that? Why is that? You see, it's because the whole point of the plagues is to show that God is a God who saves. He's always saving us. He saves everybody. In fact, let me show you first, you know who he saves? He saves the Israelites, right, naturally, through the plagues. Plagues are judgment, but they're sent to save the Israelites. That's, the Israelites were in bondage of Egypt, and because of the plagues, ultimately, they were let go, right? That's the obvious one. But the second, not as obvious, is that plagues were designed so generations would know God as the Redeemer and Savior. Did you know that? Exodus chapter 9, verse 15, God says something super fascinating to Pharaoh. Verse 15 says, For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. He was saying, man, I could have threw down my pestilence and I could have killed you. I could have knocked you out. He says, but for the purpose I have raised you up instead to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. And do you realize what he's saying at this point is that the second reason why the plagues are here is because he wants to create a story in history that will be ultimately embedded in Scripture so that millions and millions and millions of people, generations upon generations afterwards, will read this and say, God is a redeeming God. This is why. God is not here to just save one nation, but it says, according to verse 15, that he's come so that all the world will know that God is a Savior. Amen? Amen. That he comes to shower his grace and his abundance and his love to all people, not just Israelites. And that when people get a word from the word of God, then they will, from generation on end, will know all across the world that he is the Lord and he is the saving God. He says, I am a saving God. I am a gracious God. Third, the plagues were designed to awaken even the Egyptians, even the Egyptians. Because there's a place in chapter 9 where it says the Egyptians who had begun to fear the word of the Lord began to listen to God. The Egyptians were even listening to God even though they were receiving judgment. And God was using the plagues to wake up the Egyptian to ultimately save them that every one of the plagues were sent to save them. And here is really the pinnacle, I would say the apex of my sermon, because this is what you need to receive. If you receive anything else, you must receive this. And then it's, it's an immense principle that we see all throughout Scripture. That is, God's approach to judgment and salvation is not salvation or judgment. But God's approach to salvation is salvation through judgment. It's not salvation or judgment, but you and I are saved through judgment. God uses judgment to save us. Now, that seems, boy, a little counterintuitive, doesn't it? But he does use judgment to save us. In fact, you and I are only saved because there was judgment. Now, God says, I am the God above all gods. And one of the things that you'll see that sets him apart from all else is the fact that this God has judgment. Yeah, judgment. Remember what the ninth plague was? Exodus 10, 21. Let's read together. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be so Moses stretched out his hand towards heaven, and there was pitch darkness 
in all the land of Egypt for three days. Do you see what's happening here? Isn't it interesting to see that here in the ninth plague, the sun and the moon are gone. The stars are gone. And it's reverting to the void that existed before God's creation, right, in Genesis 1, where it says, before creation, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Darkness was across the land. In darkness, this was the ultimate sign that the sin of human beings is causing this incredible disintegration to the ecosystem. There was darkness over all of Egypt, pitch darkness, a darkness that could be felt. Do you realize that before Genesis 1, pitch darkness? Here in Exodus 10, the, the ninth plague was pitch darkness. Do you, do you remember there was one other time in the history of the world where there was supernatural pitch darkness? Remember? Mark 16, 33. And when the sixth hour had come, that was noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment, the earth shook and the rocks split and the presence of God left and darkness came. Disintegration brokenness. And remember how we said throughout Scripture that we see God's approach to judgment is not salvation or judgment, but rather salvation through judgment. And here we see that on the cross, Jesus Christ became an enemy of God. He, in essence, became Pharaoh himself, where he received all the ten plagues, especially the ninth were all darkness and the presence of God being removed. And after that, ultimately the tenth, which is the firstborn dying. And we see the firstborn of God here, Jesus Christ, dying on our behalf. Totally disintegrated because he was cut off from God. Everything else in his life was disintegrated. He experienced absolute agony. He was experiencing the ultimate exodus, the plagues, the darkness came down on Jesus. Why? So what you and I would not face the ten plagues. That we be saved just like the Israelites. That we, be know, we would know deeply with our utter conviction of our souls today that it is God who saves. So consider this. Jesus Christ, the judge of all the earth, didn't come to bring judgment, but was judged. Jesus Christ, the maker of the world, was unmade on the cross so that he could make you and remake you and me. And one of my favorite stories that I tell over and over and over again is one of Chuck Colson, the late Chuck Colson, I should say, who ran a prison fellowship and he tells the story once of how he visited a prison in Brazil. And it was a remarkable prison because it was awful. It was a big prison. It was a nasty prison. Inmates were going crazy. But two years before he came, two Christians came and they reorganized this prison and re-systematized this prison. And, and they were running it. And let me just read what he writes. He says, and then and there it was called Humeda. And their plan was to run it on Christian principles. The prison has only two full-time staff, and the rest of the work is done by inmates. Every prisoner was assigned another inmate to whom he was accountable. In addition, every prisoner was assigned a, a volunteer family from the outside that works with him during his term and after his release. Every prisoner joins a chapel program or else takes a course in character development. Chuck Colson says, when I visited the prison, I found the inmates smiling particularly the murderer who held the keys, opened the gates, and let me in. Wherever I walked, I saw men at peace. I saw clean living areas. I saw people working industriously. The walls were decorated with verses from Psalms and Proverbs. Now, the prison had an astonishing record 
its recidivism rate was only 4%. That is, the number of guys who actually come back to prison after they got out, opposed to the 75%, which is rest of Israel and the United States. And the question is, how is that possible? And Colson says, I saw the answer when my guide escorted me to the notorious punishment cell once used for great torture. And today, he told me, that cell houses only one single inmate. As we reached the end of the long concrete corridor, and he put the key into the lock, he paused and asked, are you sure you want to go in? And Chuck Colson said, of course. I've been in isolation cells all over the world. So slowly, he swung the massive door open, and he finally saw the prisoner in that punishment cell. A crucifix beautifully carved by the prison's prison inmates the prisoner Jesus hanging on the cross and this prisoner said to Colson he's doing time for all the rest of us he's doing time for all the rest of us now let me ask you a question how does evil reform how are these inmates, these rapists and murderers, how do they hold the keys to their cell and never leave? How? Why won't they? Why won't they revert to their previous life? Why do they obey? Because they say, Jesus is doing time for me. They know that it was Jesus who was judged in their place. He knew that the ten plagues came upon Jesus, not him, so that he would not taste a single one of those plagues. That Jesus, the ultimate judge, was judged. Jesus, the ultimate maker, was being unmade so that he could remake us. That's why Jesus is locked up. And do you see what it does for us? It makes you not fear God, but to love God. Because he took the judgment for you. It's the only way that you are saved. That's what makes Christianity so unique. You're saved by grace. You're saved by grace. So who is the Lord that I should obey him? Obey him because he's your one and true God. Obey him because he's the designer of your soul. To disobey him would be to trample on your own being. And obey him because he was the judge that was judged himself. To disobey him would trample on his heart. And you don't trample on a heart that you love. You don't. And my prayer is that you would see Jesus so glorious this morning that you say, Lord, I have a lot of sin in my life. And perhaps there is a single sin that continues to visit you, that is a part of you that you have not let go. And my prayer today is that the Holy Spirit will convict you so deep that he would identify that sin and that you will release it in Jesus' name. That Jesus will release you from the bondage and the chains that you are in bondage with so that you could experience utter freedom and utter joy and utter flourishing what is that sin for you what is that sin what is the holy spirit reminding you of convicting you of in all of our campuses would you bow your heads in prayer what area is the holy spirit confronting you to lay down today what is that sin and maybe today's obedience is the one that will break the chains so that you might flourish. Perhaps there's some of you, even in this room, that are willingly disobeying God. And you need to obey Him. He's reminding you. Maybe some of you here need to be baptized. And you know baptism is the outer sign of the fact that you recognize that there's no hope being saved except through Jesus and that you are not ashamed to tell the world about it. <laughs>
And that's what baptism is, simple as that. And I know there are a lot of people here that have been converted recently, but there's some of you who have been a believer for a long, long, long time, and you have not, you have not been baptized, and you've given every excuse under the sun. And you say, well, it's not that important, right? I mean, after all, I'm, I've been a Christian for 40 years, and I, I have not been baptized. I've been fine. Well, who are you to say that God's first command that he gives an unbelie- I mean, to a believer is not that important? If you won't obey God in this one small step, what do you think you'll do when God calls you to obey in other areas of your life? Well, you might say today, well, I was baptized as a baby, so I'm, I'm good, right? Well, that's great. But the Bible teaches that baptism is supposed to be the sign of your faith, not your parents. And I'm pretty confident that when you were baptized as a baby, you weren't very conscious or aware of the significance of your spiritual birth. So see that your first baptism as a baby was a sign of your parents' faith. And perhaps now, God is calling you to declare your own. In fact, you could think about it this way. Their hope when they baptized you as a baby was that you would grow up as a Christian. And to be baptized today in this opportunity is to ratify their decision and faith to say, Mom, Dad, what you pray for me, God heard. And that's why I'm being baptized today. Maybe you say, well, I'm not ready. I just need to be more mature in Christ. Listen, if you trust in Christ, you are ready. Baptism is only a public profession of an inward reality that you put your trust in in him and in the first service there were more people spontaneously being baptized than scheduled ones because they heard the holy spirit today well you say well maybe it's really inconvenient it's inconvenient i'm, I'm not ready I, I you know i'm wearing silk i'm wearing cashmere well listen jesus hung on the cross naked for six hours for your salvation you think getting wet in a pool of warm water is too inconvenient for you? Yeah. What does the fact that you won't go through the inconvenience of baptism say about your understanding of the gospel and the cross? And I pray whatever it is, what area in your life that you need to submit to, that you would consider it so dismally small in light of his grace over you and his love over you and his power to save your life. And Father, we come then with our morsel of faith, a morsel of, of our obedience to say, will you help us to cross that line? Will you help us to just simply obey and to trust you? That we would not trust our sin, that it brings kind of fruit or joy or fulfillment lord help us to turn to you to know that in sin disintegration in obedience there's wholeness and joy and satisfaction will you help us to take the leap today with the holy spirit speak to us and not assume that the holy spirit will come back again that if we're being spoken into now that we will see that god is talking to us and that we will receive and that we would act, that we'd be people of not just the word, but word and deed. I pray in Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Let's give God glory.